We've been hearing about King Suragu of the Hemajata tribe. Hemajata apparently means yellow haired. And it was a tribe that lived in the Himalayan foothills. The day after I made the previous video, in fact maybe even later the same day, I happened to pop into my local bargain bookshop and I happened to see this book, Alexander the Great, by Nick McCarty. And I just happened to open it at the first page. And it was such a coincidence that I think I'll, I'll, read, it, I'll read it here. I'll read here what it said. Alexander the Great led an army of as many as 70,000 men and their camp followers from one end of the known world to the other from 334 to 323 BC they fought every inch of the way this is recorded not only by writers like Plutarch and Arian but also by the names of the cities he had built as he moved across the world it is recorded in the blue eyes and blonde hair of tribesmen in the foothills of the Himalayas and in the remotest parts of Afghanistan it's it was just a coincidence that I happened to come across this passage that I thought I would mention it. It's of, of no real consequence. Although I suppose if you are concerned about the age of the Yoga Vasishta when it was written, then that would probably give some clue. But it doesn't really concern us. Suragu was coached by the sage Mandavya in self-inquiry. And last time we heard the results of Suragu's self-inquiry. Rama asked, But, O Lord, the mind is so unsteady, how can one reach the state of perfect equanimity? The sister continued, O Rama, a dialogue which is relevant to this problem took place between that very king Suragu and the sage Pariga. Listen to it. There was a king in Persia named Pariga, who was a close friend of the king Suragu. So it's interesting that this king was in Persia, also making the connection with Alexander, I guess. Once there was a great famine in the kingdom of Pariga. Sur, so distressed at heart at the very sight of his people's suffering, and seeing that all his attempts at bringing relief to them proved fruitless, Pariga went away to the forest, unbeknown to the people, to perform austerities. He lived on dried leaves and earned the name Parnada. After a thousand years of penance and contemplation, he attained self-knowledge. Thereafter, he roamed the three worlds freely. Pariga, after doing what he could for his people, gave up his kingdom and went off to be a renunciate. And, it's, and we're told that he practiced his austerities for a thousand years. One thousand years of penance and contemplation. What are we to understand? What are we to understand by this? What should we derive from it? Well, this is a very interesting dialogue we've got coming up between Suriga, Suragu and Pariga. Paraga is, a, is your traditional yogi. S Suragu reached enlightenment through self-inquiry, but Paraga is a yogi who spent 1,000 years and then roamed the three worlds freely. The three worlds include the realm of our imagination, which is sometimes called the subtle realm. The yogi has the ability to, to roam freely in that realm. We've all, we, we've all got the ability to exercise our imaginations, but the yogi has taken it to such a, a, an extent, has developed his ability to so much, that the imagination is as real, if not more real, than what the physical world is to, most, to the rest of us. So this thousand years could be the thousand years spent in the imagination, in the subtle realm because much yogic practice takes place there. We could call it the realm of the mind's eye. And 
we are going to have an interest in dialogue, I think, between the nature of the yogic realization of samadhi and samadhi as understood from the perspective of self-inquiry. Samadhi is, well, we'll find out about samadhi when we come to it. One day he met the king Suragu, whom he had known before. The two enlightened kings duly worshipped each other. After that, Parigra asked Suragu, Even as you attained self-knowledge through the instructions of the sage Mandavya, I reached it through the grace of the Lord earned by penance. Pray tell me, is your mind at perfect rest now? Are your subjects living in peace and prosperity? Are you firmly established in dispassion? Suragu replied, who can truly understand the course of the divine will. You and I had been separated by a great distance so far, but now we have been brought together. What is impossible for the divine? We have been truly blessed by your holy visit. By your very presence in our midst, we have all been rid of all sins and defects, and I feel that all prosperity stands in front of us in your form. Company of good and holy men is indeed equal to the supreme state of liberation. They don't dint on hyperbolic welcomes. Paraga said, O King, all actions that are performed by one who is firmly established in equanimity are productive of joy, not those done by others. Are you established in that state of supreme peace in which no thoughts or notions arise in your mind and which is known as samadhi? So there's an interesting question here and it's to do with the understanding of samadhi. Samadhi is what the yoga is what the yogi aims for. It's understood here as a supreme peace in which no thoughts or notions arise in the mind. And we'll hear about Suragu's understanding in the next video.